So good morning to uh, the webinar on fundraising in a box um, by Ecclesiastical Insurance. Um, do post your questions as we go through the presentations in the chat box, um, or you may like to share um, other resources um, or suggestions for fundraising from your experiences, so do post them. And there'll be a Q&A slot after the presentations where we'll be looking at your questions. Um, so before uh, we begin the presentation, um, I'll introduce our speakers and then I'll open in prayer. So this morning, um, I'm delighted um, to be joined by Heather Ford and Lynn Ingham from Ecclesiastical Insurance. <laughs> Welcome. And it's great uh, for them to be with us to explain the resource that um, hopefully you've received in the post and certainly we can send if um, you haven't got a copy yourself. Um, so to introduce um, Heather, Heather is um, a church insurance consultant with Ecclesiastical Insurance and has been there for just over a year covering the Northwest and Yorkshire. But before that, um, she worked for the Diocese of Manchester in a um, church buildings um, support officer role where there was lots of um, practical experience for seven years in fundraising and knowing the ins and outs of supporting parishes with that. And um, previous to that has experience working for housing associations, um, looking at um, managing buildings from that perspective. So welcome Heather. And Lynn um, has uh, worked, um, has a 30 year career in insurance um, involved in, in the life of the church as a church insurance consultant. Um, so it's great um, to have you with us as well. Um, Lynn particularly looks at risk management and has a previous experience in um, hospitality, um, of which um, some of our churches have cafes as well. Um, so that, that could be very useful, um, particularly looking at that at the moment. So um, thank you so much, um, Heather and Lynn, for joining us um, this morning. And um, don't worry if you don't have a pack um, to hand, um, the presentation will be summarising the key points and then um, we can get in touch with you afterwards and post one out so you have it to hand. But the information is on the Ecclesiastical Insurance website as well. So before I hand over to Heather and Lynn, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, our provider and our sustainer. Father God, I thank you for this time this morning. I pray that you would lead us and guide us. Open our ears to hear what you have to say as we learn together, as we share together, as we think of how we can Bless the parishes here represented um, to, to further your kingdom in our, our ministry and mission. So, Lord, I ask that you would lead by your Holy Spirit this morning and it would encourage and sustain us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. And I shall hand over to, um, to Heather. Thank you, Emily. We're um, delighted to be with you today, and it's it's lovely to see uh, so many of you uh, interested in in fundraising um, to, to attend this session this morning. Um, we hope you find the session um, interesting and informative. And um, as Emily had said, please do use the chat facility to share any fundraising uh, challenges or ideas you may have. Um, and also to pose it, pose any questions as, as we go through. Um, and just thanks to Emily and uh, Rebecca for facilitating um, and making this this session happen because uh, it's their organisation that has uh, that has brought this to fruition. So uh, thank you for that both. Um, Rebecca, could I have the first slide, please? So just a brief introduction about who we are, um, Ecclesiastical Insurance, as it says there, um, we've been around for over 130 years, um, started just insuring churches, um, and although we are now general insurers, we continue to specialise in 
heritage, charity, education um, and, and church insurance. Um, we've got a wide portfolio of heritage clients um, and we're the biggest insurer of grade one um, listed buildings. So we've got a wealth of experience that we can bring to our church customers. One of the um, things that makes us unique is the fact that we're owned by all churches trust um, and um, so all of the profits that we generate through our business goes through into all churches trust so that we can make grants to various charities um, and Anglican churches. There's various um, platforms, um, funding streams that all churches trust have. They have small grants which is between um, a thousand and ten thousand pounds. We have larger grants um, obviously for, for larger projects, um, those are projects over 500,000 and it's usually about 1% of the costs that we're able to provide grants for those particular projects. There's also roof alarms grants that we provide, that's up to a maximum of 2,500. Uh, and roof alarms for those churches who haven't got them, they act as a really strong deterrent for, for metal theft. Um, so if that's an issue for your church, I would highly recommend going on to the All Churches Trust website and having a look at that. Um, they also provide thematic um, grant streams as well. And those thematic grant schemes will respond to a particular need. So you may have seen last year that there was a COVID response grant stream called Hope Beyond um, and Chester Diocese um, was awarded grants, various churches were awarded grants of £45,000 through that, that Hope Beyond stream. Um, over the last two years, Chester Diocese and churches within Chester Diocese have been awarded over half a million pounds worth of grants. So if you do have a project, it's really worth having a look at the All Churches Trust website uh, to see whether they may be able to help you. As I said, we've got a specialist team, um, church team to support our church customers. Um, there's the underwriters who ordinarily are based in Gloucester, although we're all home based at the moment. Uh, we've got a group of surveyors who are regionally based and their role is to undertake surveys and valuations on the church buildings. We have risk management consultants who provide a wealth of technical information and guidance uh, for churches. There's also a risk management helpline. So if you had a particular question that you wanted to ask, they would be able to, you'd be able to give them a ring and they would be able to help you there. Uh, we've got an expert claims department. And again, for any of you who have had the misfortune to have to go through our claims process, our ethos is to find a reason to pay a claim rather than decline a claim. And we've got um, eight church consultants based across the country, of which myself and Lynn are two. Um, and we're the, the local face of ecclesiastical offering one-to-one uh, -one support to churches and parishes, and also um, a suite of training that, that we can offer on risk management, health and safety, um, and of course now the fundraising, which is which is a new um, training arm that, that we're now uh, providing. Could I have the next slide, please, Rebecca? Thank you. So just a little bit about me. Um, Emily had very kindly given a little bit of introduction. So just again to reiterate, um, I had the pleasure and honour of working with Manchester Diocese for seven years in a very similar role to Emily. Um, and in fact, our, our paths crossed. So when I moved across to Ecclesiastical, I was delighted to know that I was going to be able to continue working with, with Emily and help her um, in, in the good work that she does with the parishes in, in Chester. Uh, before that, I worked for a housing association for 15 years, project managing large residential capital projects, so slightly different to listed buildings, but very much the same um, sort of things that I was covering around risk, risk management, health and safety and, and fundraising. My whole career, as it says there, has been involved in the built environment and community development. Um, and certainly my work within Manchester Diocese and the work with Ecclesiastical is about supporting parishes to enable them to do, to do God's work. 
I'm going to hand over to Lynn for the next slide so she can just introduce herself a little bit. Thank you, Heather. I think everybody can hear me okay. I think it's camera's going to stay on Heather, but um, just to say, folks, hello, I'm Lynn Ingham. Um, I've been with Ecclesiastical for the last three years, and I was looking after the Diocese of Chester until Heather uh, fantastically came on board with us this time last year. I have got over 30 years of insurance experience, which is a very long time, and I have actually loved it. It's been a lot more interesting than you might expect it to have been. Um, my background insurance experience is really in the areas of pubs and restaurants. Pubs and churches, I always say they have, have very similar challenges, um, really, especially at the moment when um, things are really difficult for them. Um, so my home diocese is Litchfield, um, where in our local church, I'm safeguarding officer and I'm a PCC member currently in the period of vacancy. Um, so uh, really understanding the, the challenges being faced by churches. And really what we're trying to do is provide as much information and assistance as we can, either directly through local support from Heather and myself, um, or via our website, which is going to be mentioned, but it's so comprehensive. We really just want to be able to give you um, a helping hand in relation to insurance and risk management, uh, so that you can then prioritise your own mission ministry and you don't need to worry about um, other things that perhaps uh, get in the way of that. So uh, that's it for me. Catch up in a minute. Over to Heather for the next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so just before we dive into the actual fundraising in a box resource, just to give you an overview um, of, of what we provide in terms of the whole fundraising offer. Um, this was very much in response to recognising that churches are really struggling financially at the moment and just to provide some additional resources to try and make the fundraising journey uh, easier for churches and to give them some hands on tools. Um, tips and some, some guidance. So we've got the fundraising hub, which is on the website, um, which is full of top tips, uh, checklists helping parishes think about what they need to put in to um, a funding application to improve their success rate and chances of securing grant. Um, there's a number of webinars which I would direct you to because they go into a little bit more detail on some key subjects. Again, we've got one on online giving, we've got one on um, looking for funders, and we've got one on writing applications. Uh, so again, they're available on our uh, website and there's information from those webinars that you can download, some additional fact sheets. Um, the fundraising um, in a box resource, which we'll go through um, in more detail today. Uh, if you haven't got your fundraising box to hand, don't worry. Um, we, as Emily said, we'll make sure we get one across to you. Um, and finally, we've got the fundraising helpline. Um, if you phone that helpline, one of the church insurance consultants will, will get back to you. For Chester Diocese, obviously, as your church insurance consultant, it will be me um, that, that gets back to you. That helpline, the actual phone number is available on, on the website. Um, so you can have a look at that. Could I have the next slide, please, Rebecca? Thank you. Um, so what is the fundraising in the box? It's it's a bespoke resource for churches. Um, it covers general fundraising advice, but it really is built around the particular needs of, of churches and the wonderful and peculiar world of, of church and church buildings. Um, so, we, so we've tried to make it easy and accessible and give you clear guidance and step-by-step -step guides to help you through um, the, the processes that, that you need to do. Um, there's, there's five booklets um, in total which we'll be, we'll be taking you through today. Can I have the next slide please Rebecca? And the next one please. Um, I'll pass over to Lynn who will take you through the resources or, or the overview of the resources. Lovely, thanks Heather. Um, so we're just going to start with the um, the first uh, item which is um, it's a yellow it's an orange uh, leaflet that starts with fundraising support for your church from Ecclesiastical and it says fundraising in a box 
and it's a quick find guide um, really designed to make things as easy as possible because it is a little bit overwhelming just you know working you through the, the process um, so it opens out and the flap you'll see has got these two key uh, areas on it and the booklet really provides a guide to the rest of the contents um, so it gives you a quick reference showing where you need to look for your particular fundraising needs oh I've skipped forward a little bit there can we go back a couple of slides please Rebecca I'm so sorry is that possible not oh hello everybody at least I can say hello Sorry, Rebecca, can't hear you. I think you're on mute. It was all going Sorry, so well. I, I do apologize. That was my fault. I clicked on the not, wrong button to let someone in. So I do apologize. Not I'll a problem at again. all. Not a problem at all. I'll just take advantage of showing folks which booklet it is that I'm talking about. There we go. It's the pull out page anyway. That's the one. Is it and that then, one? And then on to the next slide, please, Rebecca. That's great. Thank you. That's the one. Brilliant. We're good to go. Thank you. Hmm? We've jumped forward again. Okay, hang on. Well, that eye's watching me, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, I folks. I, we keep. I do apologise for the technical glitch. It's my fault. Not a problem. I tell you what. Why don't I? I'm talking about this. If you have got the boxes, the pull out one here that we're talking about, and it's just a checklist. It's designed to sort of give you a heads up as to, um, you know, the key areas that you can, you know, that you'll be looking for and where you can find information. So if you're new to fundraising and this is the first time you're looking at it, then the, the quick find page is still, certainly the one to be uh, to be starting you off. Within that page, moving on, um, we then. It then gives you a key factors checklist, which would be the next slide. In a minute. It also, don't worry, Rebecca. Oh, here we go. There we go. So start with that one and then just, that's the one I was talking about. Thank you. And then start slide from there. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much for this, Rebecca. Yeah, I'm just having technical difficulties. I do apologise, everyone. Oh, it's, it's not a problem. Boxes. Not a problem. Let me tell you about the quick, the, uh, the the key factors checklist that we're going to be talking about in a minute when we find the slide, which is really it contains uh, you know key fundraising terms because there are there's lots of terminology. Oh, there we. Go. Thank you. Next slide, then, please. So yes, if we're talking about uh, this key factor checklist that you'll find in the, the quick find section, it really gives you a basis on which to work. Um, some key fundraising terms, it gives some definitions so that you can understand what the guides are referencing because there are quite a few terminologies um, that are uh, you know need a little bit of explanation if you're new to the role. Some of you will be very experienced in this role. So, um, you know, you i'm sure will understand the, the terminology there um we're talking in relation to fundraising we're talking about regular and planned fundraising um as well as you know so general giving as well as for specific projects um or specific needs the important thing to remember i think with this whole thing is that it doesn't it shouldn't be overwhelming just take it in bite-sized pieces i think that's the thing to to be realizing with fundraising and and hopefully what we're showing you today is just some steps that you can take along the way so you don't get overwhelmed um it's it often feels like an enormous task when you're trying to think about how we can raise funds for the parishes but um whether it's for a project or just to keep going keep the, the general costs going it's really important to sort of break it down and to keep the motivation uh, online. So the box of resources that we've got with the four different sections, four different booklets, planning, finding donors, number two, making the ask, and last but by no means least saying thank you. So that's the four things that we're gonna be looking at. And hopefully by breaking them down into different sections, 
it will give you the chance to um, you know, take it one step at a time without being too uh, overloaded. So if we could move on to the next slide, please, Rebecca, which should be number one planning. It is, that's lovely, thank you. Um, and then perhaps moving on to the next slide as well. That's just great. Here we are, we've seen this slide before. That eye keeps looking at me. Um, so really it's all about planning as ever. You know, it's a lot to do with the planning, get it right at the beginning, do the fundamentals, and then it should you know, be with you, uh, you know, stand you in good stead going forward. Definitely worth spending time at this stage. Um, and you should be looking perhaps at the three different sections that we've popped here. The, the fundraising vision um, should definitely be seeking to inspire. Um, it needs to be providing clear and consistent messages, um, communicating those shared goals, and it should be expressing them clearly, should be extinct, <laughs> sorry, extinct, it should be succinct, um, and so that it can in, in engage people. Um, and so that they are, they feel inspired to give. Uh, so we def definitely need to articulate those aims clearly. Um, and it should enable anybody that's involved in the in the, the project to be able to demonstrate and articulate what the fundraising campaign campaign is about uh, and the impact that it's going to have. So when it comes to the team, again. Um, it really should be just a team, not just one person. I know it, these things often fall on a few people, but uh, definitely try and find the right people for the team. Um, look at what tasks need to be completed, what skills are needed to complete them, and look and see what you know existing um, skills you have within your with your with your church members. What volunteers you have, uh, perhaps do a skills audit to try and find hidden talents. Um, and you, know, you never know what's out there. Certainly, I'm not sure if my knowledge of insurance is helping our church, but I'd like to think it's something that uh, is, you know, that I'm able to put forward by way of, um, uh, you know, some assistance to our to, to our church. Um, so there is in the in the uh, book number one, there is um, a, a template that helps you undertake some form of self-assessment. That's on page six of book one, if you've got it. Uh, just to give you an idea of what you've got there waiting in the wings um, to help with the fundraising uh, so projects. It's a fantastic opportunity to get other uh, new people involved, um, to engage with others. This COVID might be bringing new opportunities um, with people uh, having a little bit more time on their hands, um, perhaps different circumstances, something you know, wanting to learn new skills and wanting to put something back into the community. So it may well be that you've got volunteers out there that you didn't know you had and how lovely to be able to encourage them to get involved in a fundraising project. Definitely needing to share the load, headed up perhaps by one or two people to drive that campaign forward and to keep the momentum going. Um, but it's, it should definitely be a team effort. It's gonna be a real struggle for one person to, to, to try and uh, keep this going perhaps on their own. You can get external assistance from um, professional fundraising organisations and certainly I'd recommend perhaps looking at the Charity Commission guidance on this, which I found online in the, um, the www.gov.uk website. Um, it provides uh, a guidance, it's called Charity Fundraising, a Guide to Trustee Duties and it's CC20. And that just gives some uh, some information on the responsibilities of uh, the, the church trustees in relation to working with commercial partners in this area. So, um, you know, building the success, uh, you know, of the projects as you go along in relation to, um, you know, how you're getting on with your grant application, social media to promote these successes, and just to keep, you know, honesty and, um, sort of transparency going through. Thank you, Emily, for that. Uh, just so that people can see how the project is, is going on. Um, and, you know, you can have some fun doing a lot of this. Um, we had a quiz recently that raised some, some money and I think the quiz master group uh, had as much fun setting the quiz as they did um, when the money came in from donations afterwards. So you can have some fun and gosh, we need some of that going forward. So really need to be thinking about um, actual plans as well, fundraising and project plans, 
uh, that just help you sort of map out what funds are required to deliver on a project uh, or a mission um, and the actions and resources that you need to deliver that project effectively. Um, so the, it helps you identify um, what project costs are required and what donations and grants are going to be required to cover those costs. Um, it, there's lots on, on you know, lots of time probably will be spent on looking, uh, doing research in relation to donors and Kate, uh, Heather's going to follow on on that in a minute. Um, but uh, again, there's a template in page, uh, page 11 of book one, which will help you develop your plan in relation to grants and grant applications and timescales and things. This should be a working document. It keeps, tracks of the, it keeps track of progress, um, actions required, um, and follow up as well. So it certainly needs to be an ongoing, uh, you know, a plan just to make sure that, um, you know, things are constantly kept up to date, including, you know, successful and unsuccessful applications. Um, you know, that's actually quite helpful for future campaigns as well. So if you, you may not be successful if in applications for certain projects, but you might find that a a donor might be willing to help you on another project at another time. So certainly worth documenting all of these things uh, along the way. Um, and also it's worth noting that some funders, uh, you know, might be putting a cap on the level of professional fees that can be included in projects. So things like that are relevant uh, going forward. And the project plan then, um, you know, running alongside what I was just talking about before, which is more of a strategy uh, plan, um, again, find setting milestones on the project, um, you know, think, making sure that, again, it's breaking down into bite-sized pieces. An example of this is, is on page nine um, of the first booklet, just to see how you think, you know, what sort of milestones there might be in the plan. And if, you've, if you have got the, the document there and you see that, um, that we make a reference in, in the uh, uh, in the template to planning, um, actually, of course, it's going to be more likely it's going to be faculties really that we're going to be talking about in relation to capital projects rather than statutory planning. But again, you, if you use this, the strategy and the project plan together, you know, and they run in parallel and you keep them updated, it will certainly help with cash flow when you are successful in getting some money in, hopefully, um, and you'll be able to keep on top of when grants are coming in and expenditure is going out. Um, so which should fundamentally instill, you know, if you've got these, you know, documented plans and projects and strategies in place, it should absolutely instill confidence that the church is worth supporting financially, um, that you've, you've got a good grip of what you're doing um, and how any donor, when they're thinking of perhaps of making a contribution, how that contribution will make a, a, a valuable difference to the, to the project and to the church. So that's me. Thank you. Just over to Heather now, please, Rebecca, in the next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. That's great. So um, looking at finding donors. Uh, could I have the next slide, please, Rebecca? Thank you. Um, so really, obviously, um, finding the right donor and, and the funders is, is absolutely uh, critical. Um, there's no point applying for grants to funders that don't fund your particular sort of project. So we've got lots of resources in the box to help you organise and think um, about where and how to go about looking for the right, the right funders. This will be time consuming because there will be potentially hundreds and hundreds of funders that you might look at but there probably will only be a handful of those funders that will actually fund the sort of project that, that you're doing so you need to be prepared to do your homework you don't really need to be an expert in this you just need commitment um, and time and just going through websites their guidance notes of the individual funders to to see that whether your project matches up to what they will fund so where where can you start looking for um, these donors and, and funders? Our website um, has a list of potential funders, so that can be um, a good starting point. Um, and you can go on to the our online resource to have a look at those. 
Um, a lot, a lot of those were developed at the time um, at the beginning of COVID. So, so a lot of them were in response to COVID. But, but there are other more generalist grant funders um, in that list as well. So it's a good starting point. Um, you're really fortunate in having the wonderful resource of Emily, who's I know has got a font of, of knowledge. And so just being able to speak to Emily and, and drop Emily in an email, she'll be able to signpost you to lots and lots of resources. Uh, there's also the Church of England Parish Resources website. Um, again, that provides lots of information. Um, there's online databases. Um, now, I don't know, Emily, I know um, Chester used to be signed up for Open for Funding. I don't know whether you still are or not. We are, yes. Brilliant. The, the beauty of the online databases, uh, they'll, they'll do the searching for you. Um, so you can um, you can go onto the database, put in all the details of what you want, and they will throw out the grant funders that are most relevant to the criteria that you've put in. Um, and the open for funding database is, is basically just that it's a subscription based database that Chester Diocese pay for, for the benefit of, of the parishes. But there will be other databases out there that, that you can use and you can have a look at. Um, the Church Buildings Council, they have their own individual grant streams, but I think probably more important than, than that, they have a whole host of other information around project planning, um, project managing, um, statements of significance, statements of need, all the elements that you need as part of your fundraising campaign, um, and obviously more than we can cover in, in this seminar. And there's lots of um, newsletters that you can sign up to. The one I find particularly useful is the Historic Religious Buildings Alliance. It's a regular newsletter. It's always up to date and is specifically for churches and they always have a host of um, useful information. So I can, if you're gonna sign up to one newsletter, that's the one that I would sign up to because it's really helpful. Um, there's the diocesan e-news, which I know, again, Emily contributes to, and I'm sure you're already, already signed up to that um, there's local places you can go to as well community voluntary services they often provide local resources not specifically for churches but for um, general charities but but there may be some useful resources there um, and again they often have newsletters that you can sign up to it's always useful to check up on other projects other church websites conversations at Deanery Synod or Diocesan Synod to find out what other churches are doing. Always really helpful um, to learn from other churches to see what else has been being funded. Looking at funders' annual reports, their accounts. The bottom line is, <clears throat> excuse me, funders want you to apply to them. They, they exist purely to give money away to good causes, to make the world, the community, better places to live. Um, and the grant funders themselves will have a wealth of information that you can look at. Um, as well as the grant funders, um, there's also um, the wider community. And what do we mean by um, the wider community? That could be um, individuals, um, it could be companies. If you're looking at individuals, COVID obviously has been a really difficult time um, for people. Um, some people have fared a little, a little bit better. So it really is understanding individual circumstances and the motivations um, for people as well as to why they would give. And I always think um, a good starting point is thinking about what is my motivation? What's your motivation for giving? Because your motivation is likely to be what motivates um, other people. Um, local community. Could I have the, um, the next slide, please, Rebecca? Thank you. Um, so um, local community, it could be residents who live in the area. It could be people who have an interest um, and love in church buildings. So 
um, church crawlers, as, as they're called in, in the heritage industry, people who love going around church buildings. Um, church buildings that have got historic connection. Um, I live in Hepton Stall in, in West Yorkshire, um, and we're fortunate to have Sylvia Plath buried in the churchyard. And that brings national and international people coming to visit her grave. And so that provides a wonderful opportunity to engage in a completely different demographic than we would normally have and, and bring in different people into the church who wouldn't normally um, come in. There might be people who want to donate to specific projects, so mental health, young people's projects, older people's projects, or maybe the restoration of the church building itself. Um, are there local schools to connect with or civic groups, um, walking clubs? My um, last church when I lived in Manchester, we had a walking for health group um, and every week 75 people used to meet and end their walk in the church building and it really brought um, a vibrancy to, to that church building. And again, an opportunity to engage in a different demographic and engage with people who wouldn't ordinarily cross the threshold. It brought in a little bit of money, but that wasn't really the motivation for doing it. It was about showing hospitality and engaging people and enthusing people about the church. But it did bring in a little bit of money because they were able to sell tea, uh, tea and cakes. Um, as Lynn had already mentioned, are there um, you know, people within the church um, who might be able to help, but also other groups and what other groups are there and what skills do they have? Um, and think creatively about how you engage people. Um, there may be particular projects that people have an interest with. Graveyards are a wonderful way of engaging a wider community and can be quite attractive to the National Heritage Lottery Fund and the um, landfill operators as well. Um, again, I was involved in a church in um, Manchester and they got Heritage Lottery funding as it was then to improve the habitat value of the churchyard and the headstones, there were some very unsafe headstones and boundary walls and the um, Heritage Lottery Fund supported uh, people learning dry stone walling as, as part of the project. Um, it also created a community ownership for, for the churchyard and brought people in into the church building for other reasons as well. And some, some people actually started getting involved in the worship part of it as well. Um, and of course, any work with the churchyard uh, really works well with the carbon neutral agenda of the Church of England. And I know Emily has, has done some seminars um, on, on that already. Um, and social media as a way of engaging people as well is, is really helpful because it engages beyond the geographical area. And again, going back to my church that I've just been talking about, the Graveyard Project, uh, she opened up a Twitter account. The vicar had a Twitter account called at Heritage Hound and the story came through the dog and it really engaged people in a really positive way because they liked the idea that it was the dog telling the story of the Churchyard Project. Communication is key um, in, in all of this. Um, and it's about having that clear vision that Lynn talked about um, in her last slide about what is it you're wanting to achieve? What's the story um, that you're wanting to tell? Make it engaging because if you engage and uh, relate it to people, they're more likely to want to um, get involved and, and ultimately um, give, give money. Um, trusts, they're coming all shapes and sizes, and I've said they're there primarily to give money. Community foundations, they're a network across, um, across the country, and they basically, they bring donors and um, organisations that, that want to do good in their community um, together. Uh, I've already touched on the Heritage Lottery, National Heritage Lottery Fund, as it is now, um, and the landfill trusts. Landfill trusts are really useful for um, church buildings. 
and uh, community halls, parish halls. We've not got enough time to go into them in any great detail now, but there is a link um, at the end of this presentation on Entrust website and that'll give you more information. Uh, just touch a little bit on um, cafes and hall hire as a way of generating income. I think um, cafes can be really helpful but they don't necessarily generate a lot of income. The location of them is, is really uh, crucial. Um, Bury Parish Church have a really successful cafe, but that's in the middle um, of Bury Town Centre, so they have a, a lot of um, footfall. If you Google cafes, um, th there's lots of examples where the, there are cafes that have been put in um, and post offices as well. And the beauty of having a post office in a church is that the, it remains under the jurisdiction of the post office so they're responsible for staffing um, and the infrastructure of, of the post office and again there's some great examples uh, Yarpool um, and there's one in London um, St James West Hampstead really great examples and again so if you just google them you'll be able to find the information there uh, could we have the next slide, please, Rebecca? This um, slide, and again, this resource is in the um, fundraising the box resource, and it just helps you to document your research and just helps you uh, keep it in a neat, uh, ordered way. So there's there's a number of headings um, which are fairly self-explanatory. Just putting down the note the the name of the funder, the sort of things that they will fund, um, what they funded in the past, who are the key people that you need to contact, what's the procedure for uh, applying. So it just really gets you thinking about what are the processes for applying for the grants and, and keeping track of them as well. So because you'll probably be um, doing a patchwork of applications to lots of different people. And it will be, it's really easy to lose track of where you are with the different funders. But if you keep a written record, um, then, then you'll be able to keep, keep that updated and, and um, keep on top of things. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please, Rebecca, thank you. Um, making the ask. So I just moving forward. So this is, uh, could I have the next slide, please, Rebecca? Thank you. Um, this is all how contained within uh, booklet three. Throughout your whole fundraising journey, just remember these three things. And if this is the only thing that you remember to take away today, this will stand you in really good stead for all of your grant funding applications. What you're wanting to do is identify what is the need, what is the problem within the parish um, that you need to solve, what's the church going to do about it, and what are the outcomes, what are the, what's the difference the grant and your project going to make, how is it going to improve the situation um, in, in, that, in the parish. So just remember those, those two things and you won't go far wrong. Because at the end of the day, what the, um, what the trust is wanting to know, what funders and donors are wanting to know is what is their pound? What difference is that going to make if, if they donate? Next slide, please, Rebecca. Thank you. So making the ask, it's about developing the case for support. So winning the hearts um, and the minds. And in a nutshell, it demonstrates to funders why they should fund your project above anybody else's project. And increasingly, and I think COVID and the pandemic is gonna make funding even more competitive. It's gonna be even more important that you collate and compile that compelling case to win the hearts and minds of funders and make them want to give you their, their money. As I've said, developing the case of support is about identifying that need, the solution and the difference that it will make. So how can you identify what that need is? Well, it might be through 
the work that the church is doing already that you may have already found that there are shortfalls it might be existing partners that you're working with schools local authority health authority um, third sector voluntary organizations you might have undertaken some community consultation and community consultation doesn't have to be grand it can just be simple conversations that you have with groups or people that are using your building or you might want to do a more formal meeting where you sit people down in a room and have questions that, that you ask them whatever conversations you have make sure that you document them because you can then use that as evidence in in your applications you could also use social media um, and again as i said earlier on we've got a webinar looking at social media and how to use that effectively but you could do polls you could have conversations on facebook you could see what people are tweeting retweeting really you know use social media um, to, to find out what what's going on and what people's thoughts are the statistics are really helpful to use and the church of england have parish spotlight reports which emily should be able to point you in the direction of or if, if emily's not the right person she'll certainly be able <laughs> to point you to the person who will be able to get you those but a wealth of information provided there on on individual parishes um, and again the we've got the uh, church urban fund they have their own uh, lookup toolkit where you can put your postcode of your church um, in their website and it will um, give you lots and lots of information about what's happening um, in, in your parish, mostly around poverty, um, index of um, deprivation, those sort of things, it will provide those sorts of information, really helpful information for funders. Always be mindful that now preserving old buildings isn't sufficient, it needs to be about engaging people. Um, and making communities better for people. And buildings can be part of that, but the outcomes have to be about the difference it makes to people's lives. And that in certainly increasingly, the uh, National Heritage Fund um, used to be, what well, they were the major funder for capital repairs. They're moving away from that, and it's more and more about engagement in, um, in local communities. Include the track record of your church. Funders will want to know about the previous successes. So churches are really poor at, at patting themselves on the back. They do really wonderful work, but they're not necessarily very good at shouting from the rooftops um, from it. So really build on your reputation. Um, testimonies are really good, but obviously they need to be anonymous um, or you need to get the permission. Are you working with other people? Um, other partnerships and other organizations that you're working in partnership with funders really like to see that you're working with with other people that you're not doing it just on on your own so think about who are you working with already and who else could you work with successful applications are about tailoring the application to the funder so don't copy and paste really fine tune it to make sure it's bespoke to, to that application they need to be well thought through based based on evidence and making sure that you're applying to funders who fund your sort of project talk about the governance of your church churches have governance in place already you've got that PCC structure you've got the incumbents you've got those lines of communications already set up you've got safeguarding officers and certainly youth projects will want to see uh, those safeguarding policies in place capital projects will want to see maintenance plans in place and again those are things that that Emily will be able to help you with language is really important um, we in churches we always talk about mission secular organizations talk about outreach it's exactly the same thing it's about making um input into our local communities and making communities great places to live be realistic about costs and time scales and make sure that you build in contingency make sure that you've got those permissions in place and the grant funding 
If you're looking at selling assets, do that with caution. Um, there was a church in Gloucestershire that got their hands wrapped because they uh, sold a painting off to do some maintenance and they didn't get faculty permission for it. Um, so just be uh, cautious on that one. Um, asking the individual, it's about building those individual relationships, really understanding people's motivations for giving and developing a church confidence to speak about money and making the ask. Because again, churches themselves are very, very generous, but they often struggle to talk about money. So put it in the framework of mission. You're wanting to raise money, not for the church in itself, but in order to develop and to deliver mission. Um, online and digital, we'll talk about that in a little bit more in the next few coming slides, but it really is an opportunity to engage um, in new audiences uh, with new, new opportunities. It can target those who are, who are already in the church, but it's the potential to reach to a further audience and it's largely free and cheap as well. And you can get a much, much wider audience. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, Rebecca, thank you. So we haven't got time to go through each and every one of these, but uh, you will get a copy of the slide deck. Um, so you'll be able to have a look at the various links that, that we've put on. The first thing really to look at is, is getting an online giving site. So you need a site that somebody can then um, say, go onto your website, they'll see the giving site, they can press on that and that will take them to your giving page. And it just makes it an easy way for people to give. Um, and there's lots of information on the parish resources website um, on, on information on, on giving sites. And as I've already mentioned, we've got our ecclesiastical webinar solely on this and it will signpost you to other resources as well. The other one I just want, the other two I want to just to point out on this is QR codes. Um, we're probably more familiar with QR codes now than we've ever been because QR codes have been used for track and trace. Um, and basically QR codes are just embedded, those little squares of embedded website and giving web pages. So it just enables people to use their smartphone and it takes them directly uh, to your giving page. And the beauty of the QR code is that they can be used on uh, posters, newsletters, on websites. Um, it's a really easy way of people to give. The other one I just wanted to touch on here is the contactless devices. And again, loads of information on the Paris Resources website on the various gadgets that you can use. Um, and again, we've got more details on our webinar on that. But it's a really useful way of tapping in to um, visit the visitor pound because obviously you can use, leave the contactless device in the church and people can use their um, debit cards um, to part with their hard-earned cash and apparently people are more generous with contactless giving than they are uh, with um, money people will often ferret around for a 50p to put on the plate um, but, but they're probably too embarrassed to give 50p via contactless giving. Um, and interestingly, in 2018, con contactless giving overtook cash giving. Um, and of course, that's probably been um, even more now the case with, with COVID. So have, have a look at each, each of those. And I think the, the key to online giving really is to use different, um, different methods of, of giving and make it accessible and easy to give. But obviously don't forget the old traditional methods of giving as well. Make it inclusive rather than inclusive and make it easy for people to give. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so we'll just briefly, quickly touch on um, virtual events. Maybe virtual events are coming slightly to an end as we, as we come out of, of lockdown, but I'm sure they will still have a value. Um, so if you are thinking um, about virtual events, 
just think about the the platform to run so for example zoom as as we're using today um, and make sure you set up that that online giving page um, to receive uh, donations and using social media to get your message out so twitter facebook um, the suggestion is really is to use one or two methods of social media and use those well rather than trying to spread yourself too thinly and is using social media a way of um mission in itself you know are there younger people that you could engage with to help you deliver social media um or or are there old is uh, people who are interested in getting involved in in social media for me twitter um has been a revelation and and i got to twitter i was kicking and screaming and i really didn't want to get involved in twitter i didn't see the value of it um when i was at manchester diocese i was basically told i had to get a twitter account which i did and i have to say it's opened up a world that wouldn't have opened up to me without and for me twitter works well and it's dead easy but again with any um social media make sure you've got that clear fundraising message what is it you're wanting to do why is it you're wanting to do and what difference will people make who are involved with it um can i have the next slide please thank you um virtual events the only thing i really want to say here is google because there's loads of organizations doing lots of things um virtually um so rather than reinvent the wheel, see what other people are doing, but also ask yourself, what are you, what have you been doing in the good old world when we used to all get together face to face? What were you doing at that point um, that you could do virtually? Um, we have had permission from York Diocese to use their publicity on this one. York Diocese are brilliant. They've, they've got loads and loads of ideas. Um, so not to detract from the work that Emily's doing in Chester are doing, because I think you're really lucky to have Emily, but there's other dioceses that, that are doing lots of other things as well. So, so have a have a look around. Um, there's no point reinventing the wheel if somebody else has already done it. Next slide, please. Over to Lynn, thank you. Just keep it very quick because I'm conscious of time. Thank you, Heather. Really very simple. Um, never underestimate the value of a thank you letter is what my mum always used to say so uh, it just really um, you know, keep that clear and concise communication going right till the end so when you are fortunate um, to get some sort of uh, award or grant or donation um, as quickly as you possibly can please uh, think about saying thank you um, to those individuals that have, have given in a very personal sort of a, a thank you note um, keeping it personal as opposed to pro forma um, interesting stat, um, which was that a study in 2019 found that first time donors who receive a personal thank you within 48 hours are four times more likely to give again. So perhaps that's a nice little job for somebody to be able to say thank you, could you be in charge of our thank you notes. Um, and you know, just again demonstrate the difference that a donation has made, keep them updated on the progress of the project and think about how you might be able to celebrate once your um, project has perhaps come to fruition. Uh, don't necessarily ask for a donation straight away, but certainly know what to say um, if anybody asks you uh, if there are any other projects on the go or whatever that might be the situation. Again, perhaps don't overlook your regular donors. I think it's important to say thank you to those perhaps as well, um, you know, in the congregation, maybe something that's, um, you know, gets forgotten about. Um, methods of doing so, uh, you know, again, talking to people, um, you know, face to face, saying thank you and, you know, writing the notes and, um, videos, newsletters, all great ways, social media, of course, just to keep the story and the project alive. Um, carefully also thinking about any setbacks that have been encountered along the way. Um, and also encouraging people to get involved with ideas and suggestions and, um, you know, help them to get that connection, whether it's emotionally or spiritually involved in the project. Um, you just never know who you might be uh, engaging or connecting with. Um, who might end up being able to help you so definitely at the end of this please you know we definitely suggest that we 
um, encourage folks to be supported um, in saying thank you uh, as soon as any projects um, have, have gone on. And you can see there in the bottom right, a picture that's also in the, the box um, saying thanks for your support, uh, which can be used along the way. So I think really, um, next slide please. Again, just to reinforce, we're wrapping up now, but just to reinforce the wealth of information that's out there, um, you know, a, a load of information there on websites. And of course, Emily um, within the Diocese of Chester is fantastic. Um, next slide, please. Just looking forward to any questions that anybody, anybody might have following the discussions that we've had, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Lynn and Heather, for uh, presenting that. Um, if we could um, pause the recording, Becky, um, and then that will uh, give us the opportunity to, um, to ask any questions. That would be lovely. Very welcome. Thank you. So let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you for being amongst us this morning. Go with us as we, we go back with a, with a head full of uh, knowledge and ideas and help us sift through the things that you want us to think about as next steps. Um, as Heather said earlier, um, uh, and, and Lynn, um, this can't be done in, in one go. It's about breaking it down into steps. So Lord, show us the next steps, who to speak to, who to share this with, what, um, what next steps we need to consider. And may a blessing be on each parish um, here um, or who couldn't be with us um, as we think about um, resourcing the, the mission and the ministry for your glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for, for being with us and giving your time this morning. Uh, we hope it's been uh, inspiring. And um, I'll just hand over to Heather, who's going to um, um, just let you know about uh, an email that's following on afterwards with um, is it a survey, Heather. It, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Uh, yeah. Um, again, just thank you for engaging um, today and, and your time. And uh, we will be sending out a email just with a survey just asking for feedback so um if you could take a few minutes to have a look at that when when you receive it and send it back that would be greatly appreciated um moving forward from today just to reiterate um as your church insurance consultant um i'm here to support you as as our customers so and part of my role is to ordinarily would be to come out to meet with you I can come to PCC meetings there's a whole raft of other training that we can do as well including risk management health and safety um, so so if there's anything I can assist you with please drop me a line give me a ring um, and when I'm able to I would be delighted to to come out and uh, visit your churches and uh, and meet with you so please please do be in contact if I can help you in in any way thank you thanks so much and, uh, and god bless bye thank you folks